And now, chapter two, The Wind in the Willows, The Open Road, read by Narinder Dhaliwal. Ratty, said the mole suddenly, one bright summer morning, if you please, I want to ask you a favor. The rat was sitting on the river bank, singing a little song. He had just composed it himself, so he was very taken up with it and would not pay proper attention to Mole or anything else. Since early morning, he had been swimming in the river in company with his friends, the ducks. And when the ducks stood on their heads suddenly, as ducks will, he would dive down and tickle their necks just under where their chins would be if ducks had chins till they were forced to come to the surface again in a hurry, spluttering and angry and shaking their feathers at him, for it is impossible to say quite all you feel when your head is underwater. At last they implored him to go away and attend to his own affairs and leave them to mind theirs. So the rat went away and sat on the river bank in the sun and made up a song about them, which he called Duck's Ditty. All along the backwater, through the rushes tall, ducks are a dabbling, up tails and all. Ducks' tails, drakes' tails, yellow feet of quiver, yellow bills, all out of sight, busy in the river, slushy green undergrowth where the roach swim. Here we keep our larder, cool and full and dim. Everyone for what he likes, we like to be, heads up, tails up, dabbling free high in the blue above, swifts whirl and call, we are down a dabbling, up tails all. I don't know that I think so very much of that little song, Rat, observed the mole cautiously. He was not no poet himself, and he didn't care who knew it, and he had a candid nature. Nor don't the ducks neither, replied the rat cheerfully. They say, why can't fellows be allowed to do what they like, when they like, and as they like? instead of other fellows sitting on banks and watching them all the time and making remarks and poetry and things about them. What nonsense it all is. That's what the ducks say. So it is, so it is, said Mole with great heartiness. No, it isn't, cried the rat indignantly. Well then, it isn't, it isn't, replied the Mole soothingly. But what, what I wanted to ask you was, won't you take me to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from his mind for the day. Get the boat out, and we'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on Toad. Early or late, he's always the same fellow. Always good-tempered, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole as he got onto the boat and took the sculls while the rat settled himself com comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat. So simple, so good natured and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses. And it may be that he is both boastful and conceited, but he has got some great qualities, has Toady. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome dignified old house of mellowed red brick with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said the rat, and that creek on the left, where the notice board says, private, no landing allowed, leads to his boat house, where, where we'll leave the boat. The stables are over there to the right. That's the banqueting hall you're looking at now, very old that is. Toad is rather rich, you know, and this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit as much to Toad. They glided up the creek and the mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadow of a large dark boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats slung from the cross beams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water and the place and an unused and des deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he. Boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he has taken up now. Come along and let's look him up. We shall hear all about it quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower decked horns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon resting in a wicker garden chair 
with a preoccupied expression of face and a large mat spread out on his knees. Hooray, he cried, jumping up uh, on seeing them. This is splendid. He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once. Whatever you were doing, I want you badly, both of you. Now, what will you take? Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. Let's sit quiet a bit, Toady, said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair, while the mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toady, boisterously, or anywhere else for that matter, he could not help adding. Here the rat nudged the mole. Unfortunately, the toad saw him do it and turned very red. There was a moment's painful silence, then Toad burst out laughing. All right, Ratty, he said. It's only my way, you know, and it's all not such a very bad house, is it? You know you rather like it yourself now. Look here, let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's the most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the rat with an innocent air. You're getting on fairly well, though you splash good, but still with a very great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching you may. Oh, pooh, boating, interrupted the toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. It makes me downright sorry to see you fellows who ought to know better, spending all of your energies in that aimless manner. No, I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the remainder of mine to it and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me, squandered in trivialities. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if he will be so very good just as far as the stable yard and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly. The rat followed with a most mistrustful expression and there drawn out on, of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are, cried the toad, straddling the expanding and expanding himself. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart, the open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs, camps, villages, towns, cities, here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. Travel, change, interest, excitement, the whole world before you and a horizon that's always changing. And mind this is the finest cart of its sort that was ever built without any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited and followed him eagerly up the steps and into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted and thrust his hands deep in his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, a bird cage with a bird in it, and pots, pans, jugs and kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open a locker. You see biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, Everything you could possibly want. Soda water. Here, backy. There, letter paper, bacon, jams, cards, and dominoes. You'll find, he continues as they descended the steps, you'll find that nothing whatever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, said the rat slowly as he chewed a straw. Did I overhear you say something about we and start and this afternoon? Now, you dear good old ratty, said Toad imploringly, don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way, because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you, so please consider it settled, and don't argue. It's the one thing I can't stand. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life, and just live in a hole in a bank. And boat? I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. I don't care, said the rat doggedly. I'm not coming, and that's flat. And I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole 
and vote, and I've always done. And what's more, Mole's going to stick to me and do as I do, aren't you, Mole? Of course I am, said Mole loyally. I'll always stick to you, Rat. And what you say is to be, has got to be. All the same, it sounds as if it might have been, well, rather fun, you know, he added wistfully. Poor Mole, the life of adventurous uh, was so new a thing to him and so thrilling that this fresh aspect of it was so tempting and he had fallen in love at first sight with the canary colored cart and all its little foot fitments. The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered. He hated disappointing people and he was fond of them all and would do almost anything to oblige him. Toad was watching both of them closely. Come along in and have some lunch, he said diplomatically, and we'll talk it over. We needn't decide anything in a hurry. Of course, I don't really care. I only want to, uh, to give pleasure to you fellows. Live for others, that's my motto in life. During luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at Toad Hall always was, the Toad simply let himself go, disregarding the rat, he proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp, naturally a voluble animal and always mastered by his imagination. He painted the prospects of the trip and the joys of the open life and the roadside in such glowing colors that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Somehow, it soon seemed taken for granted by all three of them that the trip was a settled thing and the rat, though still unconvinced in his mind, allowed his good nature to override his personal objections, he could not bear to disappoint his two friends. Who were already deep in schemes and anticipations, planning out each day's separate occupation for several weeks ahead. When they were quite ready, the now triumphant toad to led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old gray horse who without being consulted, and to his own extreme annoyance, had been told off by Toad for the dis dustiest job in this dusty expedition. He frankly preferred the paddock and took a deal of catching. Meantime, Toad packed the lockers still tighter with necessities and hung nose bags, nets of onions, bundles of hay, and baskets from the bottom of the cart. At last the horse was caught and harnessed, and they set off. All talking at once, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft, as the humour took him, it was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of the thick orchards on either side of the road, birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers, passing them, gave them good day, or stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart. And rabbits sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows held up their forepaws and said, Oh my, oh my, oh my. Late in the evening, Tired and happy and miles from home, they drove up a remote common far from habitations, turned the horse loose to graze and ate their simple supper sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come, while stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and a yellow moon appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular came to keep them company and listened to their talk. At last they turned into their little bunks in the cart. And Toad, kicking out his legs sleepily, said, Well, good night, you fellows. This is the real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river. I don't talk about my river, replied the patient rat. You know I don't, Toad. But I think about it, he added pathetically in a lower tone. I think about it all the time. The mole reached out from under his blanket, felt for the rat's paw in the darkness and gave it a squeeze. I'll do whatever you like, ratty, he whispered. Shall we run away tomorrow morning, quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole in the river? No, no, we'll see it out, whispered back the rat. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by toe till this trip is ended. It wouldn't be safe for him to be left to himself. It won't take very long. His fads never do. Good night. The end was indeed nearer than even the rat it suspected. After so much open air and excitement, the toad slept very soundly and no amount of shaking could rouse him out of bed only next morning. So the mole and rat turned to, quietly and manfully, and while the rat saw to the horse and lit a fire and cleaned last night's cups and platters and got things ready for breakfast, the mole trudged off to the nearest village, a long way off for milk and eggs, 
and various necessities the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide. The hard work had all been done, and the two animals were resting thoroughly exhausted by the time Toad appeared on the scene, fresh and gay, remarking what a pleasant, easy life was that they were all leading now, after the cares and worries and fatigues of housekeeping at home. They had a pleasant ramble that day, over grassy downs and along narrow by lanes, and camped as before on a common. Only this time the two guests took care that Toad could do his fair share of work. In consequence, when the time came for starting next morning, Toad was by no means so rapturous about the simplicity of a primitive life, and indeed attempted to resume his place in his bunk. Whence he was hauled by force, their way lay, as before, cross country by narrow lanes, and it was not till the afternoon that they came out on the high road, their first high road, and their disaster, fleet and unforeseen, sprang out on them. Disaster momentous indeed to their expedition, but simply overwhelming in its effect on the after career of Toad. They were strolling along the high road easily, the mole by the horse's head, talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of sight, and nobody considered it in the least, and Toad and the water rat walked behind the cart, talking together. At least Toad was talking and Rat was saying at intervals, yes, precisely. And what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very different, when far behind them they heard a faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark center of energy advancing to them at incredible speed, while from out the dust a faint poop, poop, wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. Hardly regarding it, they turned to resume their conversation, when in an instant, as it seemed, the peaceful scene was changed, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump from the nearest ditch, it was on them. The poop, poop rang with a brazen shout in their ears. They had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco and the magnific magnificent motor car, immense, breath snatching, passionate, with its pilot tense and hugging his wheel, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance, changed back into a droning bee once more. The old grey horse dreaming as he plodded along of his quiet paddock in a new raw situation, such as this simply abandoned himself to his natural emotions, rearing, plunging, backing steadily in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head and all the mole's lively language directed at his better feelings, he drove the cart backwards towards a deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered an instant, then there was a heart-rending crash, and the canary-coloured cart, their pride and their joy, lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat danced up and danced in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains, he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrels, you highwaymen, you, you road hogs. I'll have the law on you. I'll report you. I'll take you through all the courts. His homesickness had quite slipped away from him. And for a moment, he was the skipper of a canary colored vessel driven on a shoal by the reckless jockeying of rival mariners. And he was trying to re recollect all the fine and biting things he used to say to masters of steam launches when their wash as they drove too near the bank, used to flood his parlor carpet at home. Toad sat straight down in the middle of a dusty road, his legs stretched out before him and stared fixedly in the direction of a disappearing motor car. He breathed short, his face wore a placid, satisfied expression and at intervals he faintly murmured, poop, poop. The mole was busy trying to quiet the horse which he succeeded in doing after a time. Then he went to look at the cart on its side in the ditch. He was indeed a very sorry sight. Panels and windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardine tins scattered over the wide world, and the bird in the bird cage sobbing pitifully and calling to be let out. The rat came to help him, but their united efforts were not sufficient to right the cart. Hi, Toad, they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? The toad never answered a word, or budged from his seat in the road. So they went to see what was the matter with him. They found him in a sort of trance, a happy smile on his face, 
his eyes still fixed on the dusty wake of a destroyer. At intervals, he was still heard to murmur, Poop, poop. The rat shook him by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, Toad? He demanded sternly. Glorious, stirring sight, murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion, the real way to travel, the only way to travel. Here today, in next week, tomorrow. Villages skipped, towns and cities jumped, always somebody else's horizon. Oh bliss, oh poop, poop, oh my, oh my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad, cried the mole despairingly. And to think I knew it never knew, went on the Toad in a dreamy monotone. All those wasted years that lie behind me, I never knew, never even dreamt. But now, but now that I know, now that I fully realize, oh, what a flowery track lies be spread before me. Henceforth, what dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way? What carts I shall fling carelessly in the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset? Horrid little carts, common carts, canary colored carts. What are we to do with him? asked the mole of the water rat. Nothing at all, replied the rat firmly, because there is really nothing to be done, you see. I know him from old. He is now possessed. He has got a new craze, and it always takes him that way. In its first stage, He'll continue like that for a few days now, like an animal walking in a happy dream, quite useless for all practical purposes. Never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart. A careful inspection showed them that, even if they succeeded in writing it up by themselves, the cart would travel no longer. The axles were in a hopeless state and the missing wheel was shattered into pieces. The rat knotted the horse's reins over his back and took him by the head, carrying the birdcage and its hysterical occupant in the other hand. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town, and we shall just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. But what about Toad? asked the mole anxiously, as they set off together. We can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself, in the distracted state he's in. It's not safe. Supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad, said the rat savagely. I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there were a pattering of feet behind them, and Toad caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them, still breathing short and staring into vacancy. Now look here, Toad said rat sharply. As soon as we get to the town, you'll have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about the motor car and who it belongs to and lodge a complaint against it. And then you'll have to go to the blacksmith or a wheelwright and arrange for the cart to be fetched and mended and put to rights. I'll take, it'll take time, but it's not quite a hopeless smash. Meanwhile, the mole and I will go to an inn and find comfortable rooms where we can stay till the cart's ready, until your nerves have recovered their shock. Police station, complaint, murmured Toad dreamily. My complaint of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been those shaved me, mend the cart. I've done with carts forever. I never want to see the cart or to hear of it again. Oh, Ratty, you can't think how obliged I am for you for con consenting to come on this trip. I wouldn't have gone without you. And then I might never have seen that, that swan, that sunbeam, that thunderbolt. I may never have heard that entrancing sound or smelt that bewitching smell. I owe it all to you, my best of friends. The rat turned from him in despair. You see what it is, he said to the mole, addressing him across Toad's head. He's quite hopeless. I give it up. When we get to the town, we'll go to the railway station with any luck. We may pick up a train there that will get us back to Riverbank tonight. And if ever you catch me going the pleasuring with this provoking animal again, he snorted and joined the rest of the weary trudge addressing his remarks exclusively to mole. On reaching the town, they went straight to the station and deposited Toad in the second class waiting room, giving a porter tippence to keep a strict eye on him. They then left the horse at an inn stable and gave what directions they could about the cart and its contents. Eventually a slow train having landed them at a station, not far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spellbound sleepwalking Toad to his door, put him inside it and instructed his housekeeper to feed him and dress him and put him to bed.
Then they got out their boat from the boathouse, scored down the river home, and at a very late hour, sat down to supper in their own cosy riverside parlour to the rat's great joy and contentment. The following evening, the mole, who had risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing when the rat, who had been looking up his friends and gossiping, came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. There's nothing else to be talked about. All along the river bank, Toad went up to town by an early train this morning, and he has ordered a large and very expensive motor car. Chapter Three, The Wild Wood. The mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the badger. He seemed by all accounts to be such an important personage and though rarely visible to make his unseen influence felt by everybody at, about the place. But whenever the mole mentioned his wish to the water rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the rat would say. Badger will turn up someday or other, he's always turning up, and then I'll introduce you, the best of fellows, but you must not only take him as you find him, but when you find him, couldn't you ask him here, dinner or something, said the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Badger hates society, and invitations, and dinner, and all that sort of thing. Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. He's so very shy. He'd be sure to be offended. I've never even ventured to call on him at his own home, myself, though I know him so well. Besides, we can't. It's quite out of the question, because he lives on the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right, you know. Oh, I know. I know. So it is, replied the rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now. Not just yet. It's a long way, and he wouldn't be at home at this time of year. Anyhow, and he'll be coming along some day, if you'll wait quietly. The mole had to be content with this, but the badger never came along, and every day brought its amusements, and it was not till summer that was long over and cold, and frost and miry ways kept them so much indoors, and the swollen river raced past outside their windows with a speed that mocked at boating of all sort of kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistence on the solitary grey badger, who lived his own life by himself in his hole in the middle of the wild wood. In the winter time, the rat slept a great deal, retiring early and rising late. During his short day, he sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic jobs about the house. And of course, there were always animals dropping in for a chat. And consequently, there was a good deal of storytelling and comparing notes on the past summer and all its doings. Such a rich chapter it had been. When one came to look back on it all, with illustrations so numerous and so very highly coloured, the pageant of the riverbank had marched steadily along, unfolding itself in some pictures that succeeded each other in stately procession, Purple loose stripe arriving early, shaking luxuriant tangled locks along the edge of the mirror, whence its own face laughed back at it. Willow herb tender and wistful, like a pink sunset cloud, was not slow to follow. Comfrey, the purple hand in hand with the white, crept forth to take its place in the line, and at last one morning, a diffident and delaying dog rose stepped delicately on the stage, and one knew, as if string music had announced, it in stately chords that strayed into a gavot that June was last was here. One member of the company was still awaited, the shepherd boy for the nymphs to woo, the knight for whom the ladies waited at the window, the prince that was the kiss, the sleeping summer back to life and love. For when meadow sweet, debonair and odorous in amber jerkin moved graciously to his place in the group, then the play was ready to begin. And what a play it had been. Drowsy animals snug in their holes while wind and rain were battering at their doors, recalling skill, keen mornings, an hour before sunrise, when the white mist that as yet undispersed clung closely along the surface of the water. Then the shock of the early plunge, 
the scamper along the bank and the radiant transformation of earth, air and water, when suddenly the sun was with them again and gray was gold and color was born and sprang out of the earth once more. They recalled the languorous siesta of hot midday, deep in green undergrowth, the sun striking through in tiny golden shafts and spots, the boating and bathing of the afternoon, the rambles along dusty lanes and through yellow cornfields and the long cool evening at last when so many threads were gathered up, so many friendships rounded and so many adventures planned for the morrow. There was plenty to talk about on those short winter days when the animals found themselves round the fire. Still the mole had a good deal of spare time on his hands and so one afternoon when the rat in his armchair before the blaze was alternatively dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't fit, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wildwood and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon with a hard, steely sky overhead. When he slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air, the country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought he had never seen so far, so intimately into the inside of things as on that winter day when nature was steep in its her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. Corpses, dells, quarries, and all hidden places which had been a mysterious mind for exploration in a leafy summer, now exposed themselves and their secrets pathetically and seemed to ask him to overlook their shabby poverty for a while till they could riot in rich masquerade as before and trick the ent and entice him with the old deceptions. It was pitiful in a way and yet cheering, even exhilarating. He was glad that he liked the country, undecorated, hard, stripped of its finery. He had got down to the bare bones of it, and they were fine and strong and simple. He did not want the warm clover and the play of seedling grasses and the screens of quickset. The billowy drapery of, of beech and elm seemed the best away, and with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on towards the wild wood, which lay before him low and threatening, like a black reef in some still southern sea. There was nothing to alarm it at first entry, Twigs crackled under his feet, logs tripped him, funguses on stumps resembled cockatoos and startled him for the moment by their likeness of something familiar and far away. But that was all fun and exciting. It led him on. He penetrated to where the light was less, the trees crouched nearer and nearer, and the holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder and indistinctly that he first thought he saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face, looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully, not to begin imagining things, or there would be simply no end to it. He passed another hole and another, and another, and then, yes, no, yes, certainly a little narrow face with hard eyes had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself up for an effort and strode on. Then suddenly, as if it had been so all the time, every hole far and near, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to pass, possess its face, coming and going rapidly, fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the banks, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began, very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him, when first he heard it, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then, still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him and made him hesitate and want to go back. As he halted in indecision, it broke out on either side and seemed to be caught up and passed on throughout the whole length of the wood to its farthest limit. They were up and alert and ready, evidently whoever they were, and he was alone and unarmed and far from any help 
and the night was closing in. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first, so slight and delicate from the sound. Then it, as it grew, it took a regular rhythm and he knew it was for nothing else but a pat, pat, pat of little feet. Still a very long way off. Was it in front or behind? It seemed to be very, to be first one, then the other. Then both, it grew and it multiplied till from every quarter as he listened anxiously, leaning this way and that, it seemed to be closing in on him. As he stood still to hearken, a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. He waited, expecting it to slacken pace or to swerve from him into a different course. Instead, the animal almost brushed him as it dashed past. His face set and hard, his eyes staring. Get out of this, you fool, get out! The mole heard him mutter as he swung round a stump and disappeared down a friendly burrow. The pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something or somebody. In panic, he began to run too, aimlessly. He knew not whither. He ran up against things. He fell over things and into things. He darted under things and dodged round things. At last, he took refuge in the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree, which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety, but who could tell? Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further and could not only struggle down into the dry leaves, which had drifted into the hollow and hope he was safe for the, for the time. And as he lay there panting and trembling and listening to the whistlings and the patterings outside, he knew it at last in all its fullness, that dread thing which other little dwellers in field and hedgerow had encountered here and known as their darkest moment, that thing which Rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. Meantime, the Rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. His paper of half-finished verses slipped from his knee. He fell, his head fell back, his mouth opened, and he wandered by the verdant banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped, fire crackled and sent a split of flame, and he woke up with a start. Remembering what he had been engaged upon, he reached down to the floor for his verses, poured over them for a minute, and then looked round for the mole to ask him if he knew a good wine for something or other. But the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly! several times and receiving no answer got up and went out into the hall the mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg his galashes which always lay by the umbrella stand were also gone the rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside hoping to find the mole's tracks they were there sure enough the galashes were new just bought for the winter and the pimples on their soles were fresh and sharp he could see the imprints of them in the mud, running along straight and purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat looked very grave and stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt round his waist, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took up a stout cudgel that stood in a corner of the hall and set off to the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. Here and there, wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at the sight of the valorous animal, his pistols and the great ugly cudgel in his grasp, and the whistling and pattering which he had heard quite plainly on his first entry died away and ceased, and all was very still. He made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge, then forsaking all paths, he set himself to traverse it, laboriously working over the whole ground and all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's old rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more. Then at last to his joy, he heard a little answering cry Guiding himself by the sound, he made his way through the gathering darkness to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it. And from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow 
and there he found them all, exhausted and still trembling. Oh, Rat, he cried, I've been so frightened, you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the Rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it, Mole. I did my best to keep you from it. We river bankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. If we have to come, we, have, we come in couples, at least then we're generally all right. Besides, there are a hundred things one has to know, which we understand all the time and you don't as yet. I mean, passwords and signs and sayings which have power and effect and plants you carry in your pocket and verses you repeat and dodges and tricks you practice, all simple enough when you know them, but they've got to be known if you're small or you'll find yourself in trouble. Of course, if you were badger or otter, it would be quite another matter. Surely the brave Mr. Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Oh, Toad, said the rat, laughingly, heartily. He wouldn't show his face here alone, not for a whole hatful of golden guineas, Toad wouldn't. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of the rat's careless laughter, as well as by his sight of his stick and his gleaming pistols, and he stopped shivering and began to feel bolder and more himself again. Now then, said the rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together and make a start for home while there's still a little light left. It will never do to spend the night here, you understand. Too cold for one thing. Dear Ratty, said the poor Mole, I'm dreadfully sorry, but I'm simply dead beat, and that's a solid fact. You must let me rest here a while longer and get my strength back if I am to get home at all. Oh, all right, said the good-natured Rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now, anyhow and there ought to be a bit of moon later. So the mole got well into the dry leaves and stretched himself out and presently dropped off into sleep, though of a broken and troubled sort, while the rat covered himself up too, as best he might, for warmth and lay patiently waiting with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up, much refreshed and in his usual spirits, the rat said, now then, I'll just take a look outside to see if everything's quiet and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, hello, hello, here is a go. What's up, Ratty, said the mole. Snow is up, replied the Ratty briefly, or rather down, it's snowing hard. The mole came and crouched beside him and looked out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite a changed aspect, holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls, and other black menaces to the wayfarer were vanishing fast, and a gleaming carpet of fairy was springing up everywhere that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. A fine powder filled the air and caressed the cheek with a tingle in its touch, and the black boles of the trees showed up in a light that seemed to come from below. Well, well, it can't be helped, said the rat, after pondering. We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. The worst of it is, I don't know exactly where we are. And now this snow makes everything look so very different. It did indeed. The mole would not have known that it was the same wood. However, they set out bravely and took the line that seemed the most promising, holding on to each other and pretending with invincible cheerfulness that they recognized an old friend in every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them or saw openings or gaps or paths with a familiar turn in them in the monotony of white space and black tree trunks they re that refused to vary. An hour or two later, they had lost all count of time. They pulled up, dispirited, weary, and hopeless at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to discover their breath and consider what was to be done. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles, they had fallen into several holes and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep that they could hardly drag their little legs through it, and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. There seemed to be no end to this wood, and no beginning, and no difference in it, and worst of all, no way out. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it and do something or other. The cold is too awful for anything, and the snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered out him and considered, look here, he went on. This is what occurs to me. There is a sort of dell, 
that down there in front of us, where the ground seems all hilly and humpy and hum hummocky, we'll make our way down into that and we'll try and find some sort of shelter, a cave or a hole with a dry floor to it and out of the snow and the wind and there we'll have a good rest before we try again, for we're both of us pretty dead beat. Besides, the snow may leave off or something may turn up. So once more they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and the protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits the rat had spoken of. when suddenly Mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor shin. And he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Poor old Mole, said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at that leg. Yes, he went on, down on his knees to look. You've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get my handkerchief and I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. Oh my, oh my. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. Looks like it were made by a sharp edge of something in metal. Funny, he pondered a while and examined the humps and slopes around them. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the log with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored all four legs, working busily while the mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals. Oh, come on, rat. Suddenly the rat cried, hooray, and then hooray, ray, ray, and fell to ex executing a feeble jig in the snow. What have you found, ratty, asked the mole, still nursing his leg. Come and see, said the delighted rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last slowly, I see it right enough. Seen the same sort of thing before lots of times. Familiar object, I call it, a door scraper. Well, what of it? Why dance it jigs around a door scraper? But you don't see what it means. You, you dull-witted animal, cried the rat impatiently. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. It simply means that some very careless and forgetful person left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood, just where it's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call it. When I get home, I shall call and complain about it to somebody or other. See if I don't. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Rat. In despair at his obtuseness. Here, stop arguing and come and scrape. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions around him. After some further toil, his efforts were rewarded and a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There, what did I tell you, exclaimed the rat in great triumph. Absolutely nothing whatever, replied the mole with his perfect truthfulness. Well now, he went on, you seem to have found another piece of domestic litter, done for and thrown away, and I suppose you're perf perfectly happy. Better go ahead and dance your jig around that if you've got to, and get it over, and then perhaps we can go on and not waste any more time over rubbish heaps. Can we eat a doormat? or sleep under a doormat, or sit on a doormat, and sledge home over the snow on it, you exasperating rodent. Do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the mole quite pettishly, I think we've had enough of this folly. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything? They simply don't do it. They are not that sort at all. Doormats know their place. Now look here, you, you thick-headed beast, replied the rat, really angry. This must stop, not another word, but scrape, scrape, and scratch, and dig, and hunt round, especially on the sides of the hummocks, if you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for it's our last chance. The rat attacked a snowbank beside them, with ardor, probing with his cudgel, everywhere and then digging with fury. And the mole scraped busily too, more to oblige the rat than for any other reason, for his opinion was that his friend was getting lightheaded. Some ten minutes hard work and the point of the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow. 
He worked till he could get a paw through and feel, then called them all to come and help him. Hard at it went the two animals, till at last the result of their labours stood full in view of the astonished and hitherto incredulous mole. In the side of what had seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid-looking little door, painted a dark green, an iron bell pole hung by the side, and below it on a small brass plate, neatly engraved in square capital letters, they could read by the aid of the moonlight, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backwards on the snow from sheer surprise and delight. What, he cried in penitence, you're a wonder, a real wonder, that's what you are. I see it all now. You argued it out step by step in that wise head of yours from that very moment that I fell and cut my shin. And you looked at the cut and at once your majestic mind said to itself, door scraper. And then you turned to and found the very door scraper that done it. Did you stop there? No, some people would have been quite satisfied, but not you, your intelligent went on working. Let me only just find a doormat, says you to yourself. And my theory is proved. And of course, you found your dormer. You, you're so clever. I believe you could find anything you liked. Now, says you, that door exists as plain as if I saw it. There's nothing else remains to be done but to find it. Well, I've read about that sort of thing in books, but I've heard come across it before in real life. You ought to go where you'll be properly appreciated. You're simply wasted here among us fellows. If I only had your head, Ratty. But as you haven't interrupted the rat rather unkindly, I suppose you're, you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk. Get up at once and hang on to that bell pull you see there and ring hard, as hard as you can while I hammer. While the rat attacked the door with his stick, the mole sprang up to the door pole, clenched it in his swung there, both his feet well off the ground and from quite a long way off, they could faintly hear a deep-toned bell respond.